This book is in two parts, Reflections on Kant and on Marx. Although the two names would appear to split the book, it is in fact thoroughly inseparable. The two parts, uh, two parts are interactive through and through. The whole of the project, what I call transcritique, forms a space of transcoding between the domains of ethics and political economy. Between the Kantian critique and the Marxian critique, this is an attempt to read Kant via Marx and Marx via Kant, and to recover the significance of the critique uh, common to both. This critique is... Oh, that's... Sorry, I see some of the words are cut off. Let's just... Actually, that's much better. Um, it's gonna be a little smaller, but... I don't know, it looks good on my screen. Hopefully it looks fine on yours. That may be too much, there we go. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, uh, this is an attempt to read Kant via Marx and Marx via Kant and to recover the significance of critique common to both. This critique is something that begins from a scrutiny, a rather elaborate self-scrutiny. Now, res with respect to the pairing itself, quite a few thinkers have sought to connect these two since the late 19th century. This was an effort. Ooh. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this was an effort to grasp a subjective ethical moment missing in the in the materialism called Marxism. It speaks to the fact that Kant was not not in the least a bourgeois philosopher. To him, being moral was less a question of good and evil than of being ca casa sui and hence free. And this compels us to treat other people as free agents. The ultimate message of Kantian moral laws lies in the imperative, quote, act so that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in any other person, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means, end quote. And there's a footnote there for where that quote is from. Um, let's see. I'm just gonna... <laughs> Notes, 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 notes. Uh, preface. So, Immanuel Kant, Groundwork uh, of the Metaphysics of Morals, translated and edited by Mary Gregor, Cambridge, Cambridge Ad University Press, 1998. Cool. Um, I'm going to find something to bookmark this with because we'll be probably jumping back and forth between all the notes. paper I just tore out of my notebook will suffice and see I lost the page but we're close to it there we go boom there we go kind of wish sorry I know that's a little jostly um... okay um this is not an abstract doctrine. Kant considered it as it a task to be realized progressively and in the context of historical society. It might be that in the concrete, th his goal was to establish an association of independent small producers in opposition to the civil society dominated by merchant capitalism. This was an ideal conceived in pre-industrial capital capitalist Germany. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Later, however, in tandem with the rise of industrial capitalism, the unity of the independent small producers was mostly disbanded. But Kant's moral law survived. Abstract as it might have been, Kant's position was a precursor to the views of the utopian socialists and anarchists such as Proudhon. In this precise sense, Herman Cohen, Herman Cohen identified Kant as the true primogenitor of German socialism. In the context of, capital, of a capitalist economy, where people treat each other merely as a means to an end, the Kantian kingdom of freedom, or kingdom of ends, clearly comes to entail another new meaning, that is, communism. 
If we think about it from the beginning, communism could not have been conceptualized without the moral moment inherent in Kant's thinking. Unfortunately, and unfairly however, Kantian Marxism has been eclipsed by history. I too came to connect, came to connect Kant and Marx, yet in a different context from Neo-Kantianism. From the beginning, the Kantian Marxist recognition of capitalism appeared to me to be feeble. I felt the same way about anarchists or associationists. While their sense of freedom and ethical disposition are noteworthy, what was un undeniably missing in them was a theoretical approach to the forces of the social relations that compel people. For this reason, their struggles were mostly helpless and miserably defeated. Uh, my political stance was once anarchistic, and I was never sympathetic to any Marxist party or state. Yet at the same time, I was deeply in awe of Marx. My admiration for Capital, the book with the subtitle Critique de Politician Economy, or Critique of the Economics of Nations, has only intensified year by year. Being a student of political economy and reading Capital closely, sentence by sentence, I was always aware of and discontented with the fact that Marxist philosophers from Lukács to Althusser did not read it full-heartedly, but instead only took what, from it what was suitable to their philosophical concerns. <clears throat> I was also discontented with the majority of political economists who deem capital simply a book on economy. Meanwhile, I gradually recognized that the Marxian critique was not a mere criticism of capitalism and classical economics, but a project that elucidates the nature and the limit of capital's drive, Trib. and furthermore, reveals on the basis of the drive an essential difficulty entailed in the human act of exchange, or more broadly, communication. Capital... Capital does not offer an easy exit from capitalism. Rather, only by its very exitlessness does it suggest a po possibility of practical intervention. Along the way, I became increasingly aware of Kant as a thinker who also sought to suggest the possibility of practice. Less by a criticism of metaphysics, as is usually thought, than by bravely shedding light on the, hit on the limit of human reason. Capital is commonly read in relation with the Hegelian philosophy. In my case, I came to hold that it is only the critique of pure reason that should be read while cross-referencing capital. Thus, the Marx-Kant intersection. Marx spoke very little of communism, except for the rare occasions on which he criticized others' discourses on the subject. He even said somewhere that speaking of the future was itself reactionary. Up until the climate climate change of 1989, I also despised all ideas of possible futures. Little, uh, little pessimistic there, aren't we, Tiger? Um, I believe that the struggle against capitalism uh, and the state would be possible without ideas of a future and that we should only sustain the struggle endlessly in response to each contradiction arising from a real situation. The collapse of the, of uh, the collapse of the socialist bloc in 1989 compelled me to change my stance until then. I, as many others had been rebuking Marxist states and communist parties. That criticism had unwittingly taken for granted their solid existence and the appearance that they would endure forever. As long as they survived, we could feel we had done something just by negating them. When they collapsed, I realized that my critical stance had been paradoxically relying on their being. I came to feel that I had to state something positive. It was at this conjecture that I began to confront Kant. Uh, Kant is commonly and not wrongly known as a critic ooh, as a critic of metaphysics. For the development of this line, the influence of Hume's skeptical empiricism was large. Kant confessed that it was the idea that first interrupted his dogmatic slumber. Note 2. This is C. Immanuel Kant, uh, prolig Prolegomena and any future metaphysics 1783 
blah, blah, blah. Um, do, 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 do. So, uh, but what is overlooked is that at the time he wrote Critique of Pure Reason, metaphysics was unpopular and even disdained. On the pre preface, he expressed his regrets, quote, there was a time when metaphysics was called the queen of all sciences, and if the will be... And if the will be taken for the deed, it deserved this title of honor on account of the preeminent importance of its object. Now, in accordance with the fashion of the age, the queen proves despised on all sides. It follows that for Kant, the primary task of critique was to recover metaphysics proper function. Uh, let's can't really see that with the little thing. Uh, this, is, this in turn charged Kant with a critique of Hume, who had once radically stimulated him. I now want to reconsider the relationship between Kant and Hume in the context of the current debate. During the 1980s, a revival of Kant was a discernible phenomenon. In Hannah Arendt's pioneering work, Lectures on Kant's Political Philosophy, and in Jean-Francois Lyotard's uh, Le Le enthousiasme, uh, la critique Kantienne de de l'histoire. Uh, I fucking these fucking French people. Jesus Christ. Uh, the return of Kant meant a rereading re of Critique of Judgment. The point taken was that universality, a sign sine qua non for the judgment of taste, cannot be achieved. In reality, among a multitude of conflicting subjects. At best, what one gets is a common sense that regulates conflicting tastes case by case. This would appear to be drastically different from Kant's critique of pure reason, which assumed a tr excuse me, which assumed a transcendental ob subjectivity that watches over universality. A reading that I examine in the following chapters. The political implications of this new appreciation of Kant were clear, not accepting those of Habermas, who sought to reconsider reason as quote unquote communi communicative rationality. It was a criticism of communism qua metaphysics. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, it was a critique of communism through, through metaphysics? I. Qua? I can't remember what quads. Let's fucking look it up, cause <sighs> my my Latin is uh, bad. As being in the character or capacity of. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. So communism as metaphysics. Uh, Marxism has been accused of being. Of being ra rationalist and teleological. In its attempt to realize the grand narrative. Stalinism was indeed a consequence of the of this tendency. The party of intellectuals led the oh, led the populace by reason uh, sorry uh, by reason embodying the law of history and thus the infamous tragedy. In opposition to this the power of reason has been questioned, the superiority of intellectuals has been denied, and the teleology of history negated. The re-examination of Marxism has involved as involved, ugh, sorry, the re-examination of Marxism has involved public consensus and negotiation among multiple languages. Multiple language, oh, wait, ugh. Ugh. where? The re-examination of Marxism has involved public consensus and negotiation among multiple language games as opposed to the central control of reason and and hetero 
heterogeneity of experience or complexity of causality as proposed to a rationalist, metaphysical view of history. On the other hand, the present, which has hitherto been sacrificed by Telos, is reaffirmed in its qualitative heterogeneity, or in the sense of Bergson's Bergsonian duration. I don't know what the fuck that means. Uh, I too was part of this vast tendency uh, called deconstruction or the archaeology of knowledge and so on. Which I realized later could have critical impact. Oh, sorry. Uh, which I realized later could have critical impact only while Marxism actually ruled the people of many nation states. In the 1990s, this tendency lost its impact, having become mostly a mere agent of the real deconstructive movement of capitalism. Skeptical relativism, multiple language games, or public consensus, aesthetic affirmation of the present, empirical history, historicism, appreciation of subcultures or cultural studies, and so forth, lost their most subver subversive potencies and hence became the dominant ruling thought. Today, these have become official doctrine in the most conservative institutions of economically advanced nation states. All in all, this tendency can be summarized as the appreciation of empiricism, including aestheticism, against rationalism. Okay. Um, in this sense, it has become increasingly clear that the return of Kant in recent years has actually been a return to Hume. Meanwhile, in the effort, meanwhile, it was in the effort of going beyond the empiricist tendency as a critique of Hume that I began to read Kant. <sighs> this, to state it outright, is a project to reconstruct the metaphysics called communism. It was Kant who provided the most lucid insight into metaphysics, proper role, at the and the inseparable and inevitable tie between faith and reason. Thus, I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And the dogmatism of metaphysics, i.e. the prejudice that without cri criticism reason can make progress in metaphysics, is the true source of all unbelief, conflicting with morality, which unbelief is always very dom dogmatic. All right. Um, note four. Cri in Critique of Pure Reason, page 117. Um, So, wait. Quote, Thus I had to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith in the dogmatism of metaphysics, i.e. the prejudice that without criticism, reason can make progress in metaphysics, is the true source of all unbelief conflicting with morality, which unbelief is always very dogmatic. I don't know what to make of that, honestly. I haven't read Critique of Pure Reason. Um, I'm... I, this is honestly my first foray into Kant, really. So, uh, I'm in for, I guess we're in for a wild ride. Um, let's push on, I guess. Uh, with this statement, it is not that Kant sought to recover religion per se. What he affirmed was the aspect of religion that tends toward morality, encouraging us to be moral. In contrast to mainstream Marxists, Marx persistently refused to consider communism as, quote, constitutive idea or constitutive use of reason in Kant's sense in Kant's sense and he rarely spoke of the future let's read that again sorry in contrast to mainstream Marxists Marx persistently refused to consider communism as a constitutive idea or constitutive use of reason in Kant's sense and he rarely spoke of the future Thus, in the German ideology, Marx made an addition to the text written by Engels, quote, communism for us is not a state of affairs which is to be established, 
an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement, which abolishes the present state as state of things. The conditions of this movement result f- from the now existing premise. Therefore, the dogmatism of communism as a scientific socialism was much the kind of metaphysics Marx refuted. But this is not contradictory to the fact that he nurtured communism as, quote, regulative idea, regulative use of reason. So, the young Marx stressed the categorical imperative, quote, the criticism of religion ends with the teaching that man is the highest being for man. Hence, eh. Hence, with the categorical imperative to overthrow all relations in which man is debased, enslaved, forsaken, is, is a debased, enslaved, forsaken, despicable being. Um, what's that? Where is that? Karl Marx... Uh, sorry. Uh, it's six. Karl Marx: A Contribution to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Law. Introduction. Um. <laughs> oh, there's some German there that I am not even going to try to pronounce. Cause holy fuck, there's a. Uh, Whatever that letter is, I don't, it's a, maybe it's a Greek letter. It's a B. Uh, 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 yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. For him, communism was a Kantian categorical imperative, sorry, that is practical and moral par excellence. He maintained this stance his whole life, though later he concentrated his efforts on the theoretical search of for the historical materialism, material conditions that would enable the categorical imperative to be realized. Meanwhile, the mainstream Marxists, ooh, uh, sorry, having derided. Meanwhile, the mainstream Marxists, having derided morality and advocated historical necessity, and uh, scientific socialism, ended up constituting a new type of slave society. This was nothing short of what Kant called all pretensions of reason in general. And then there's the German translation of it, I guess. Distrust of communism has spread, and the responsibility for the true source of all unbelief lies with dogmatic Marxism. What does he mean by that? Uh, The responsibility of the source of... Sorry, um, one cannot and should not forget the miseries of the 20th century caused by communism, nor should one take this mistake simply as misfortune. From that conjecture onward, we have not been allowed to advocate, uh, sorry, uh, We've not been from the juncture that juncture onward. We have not been allowed to advocate idea of any kind. Not even the new left, which came into existence by negating Stalinism with a naive positivity. That is why, quote, in accordance with the fashion of the age, communism proves despised on all ideas. End quote. Yet at the same time, other kinds of dogmatism are flourishing in various costumes. Furthermore, while intellectuals of advanced nations, Ooh. sorry. Mm. Furthermore, while intellectuals of advanced nations have been expressing their distrust of morality, various kinds of religious fundamentalism have begun to gain strength all over the world, and the intellectuals cannot simply scorn them. This is uh, this was written. This is published in I think two thousand five. Let's see. 
um, 2003, sorry. So the War on Terror was just starting, really, um, when he's writing this. So I guess, um, you know, religious fundamentalism was, uh, you know, m much more of a perceived problem than in the recent past, I suppose. Um, do -do -do. So, let's see. Uh, for these reasons, beginning in the 1990s, my stance, if not my thinking itself, changed fundamentally. I came to believe that theory should not remain in the critical scrutiny of the status quo, but should propose something positive to change the reality. Okay, okay. I can, I can kind of get behind that. Um, at the same time, I reconfirmed the difficulty of doing so. Social democracy, to me, would not offer any promising prospect, and it, it was fundamentally around the turn of the new century that I began to see a ray of hope that led me to organize the new associationist movement in Japan. Certainly innumerable real movements that seek to abolish the status quo are occurring in all corners of the world inevitably under the process of the... <sighs> oh, sorry. Under the procession of the global globalization of world capitalism. But in order to avoid the reputation of bygone mistakes, I insist that a transcritical recognition is necessary. This is not to say a new practice cannot be initiated without thorough scrutiny of existing theories, and the theories to which I refer are not limited to political ones. I became convinced that there is nothing that is unaffected by or outside of Kantian and Marxian critiques. In this project, henceforth, I did not hesitate to di dive into all possible domains, including the theory of mathematical foundations, linguistics, aesthetics, and ontological philosophy, i.e. existentialism. I dealt with problems which, with which only specialists are customarily concerned. Furthermore, part one on Kant and part two on Marx were written as independent reflections, so the report might be ostensible. For this reason, I had to write a rather long introduction in order to make the connection visible, if not to summarize the whole book. Notwithstanding the complexity and variety of the theoretical subjects, however, I believe that the book is accessible to the general reader. The book is based upon a series of essays that were published in the Japanese literary monthly Gunzo, beginning in 1992. They were published alongside novels, which is to say that I did not write them in the enclosure of the academy and scholarly discourse. I wrote them for people who are not grounded in special domains, like me. Great. Love that. Um, although this is already kind of a little spacey for me, um, having a tough time keeping up. Maybe because I'm a big old dumb dumb. I'm a dumb dumb dummy guy. Anyway. Uh, thus, the nature of the book is not academic. There are many academic papers on Kant and Marx that carefully research historical data, point out their theoretical shortcomings, and propose minute and sophisticated doctrines. I'm not interested in doing that. I would not dare to write a book to reveal shortcomings. I would rather write a book... Right, sorry, I would not dare to write a book to reveal shortcomings. I would rather write one to praise and only for praiseworthy works. So it is that I do not quibble with Kant and Marx. So it is that I do not quibble with Kant and Marx. Um, I sought to read their texts focusing on the center of their potencies. But I think that as a consequence, no book is more critical of them than this. Oh, okay. The main target... Ooh, sorry. Um, the main target of the book is the trinity of cap capital nation state. I have to admit, however, that many analyses of state and nation are not fully developed. 
The considerations on the economy and rev revolution of the underdeveloped, agricultural-centered, and developed countries are not sufficient. These are my future projects, which maybe I will read at some point if he actually wrote them. I, I, I know he's written a, a shitload of books and a bunch of, like, Marxian, Marxist, whatever uh, stuff, so... I assume he actually did go on to s at least one or two of these. Finally, I include here only a small portion of my reflections on the particular historical context of Japan, the state, its modernity, and its Marxism, in which my thinking was fostered. I plan to deal with these in a sequel in fact i owe much of my thinking to the tradition of japanese marxism and trans critique was nurtured in the difference between japanese and western as well as asian contexts and in my own singular experience of oscillating transversing oscillating and transversing between them in this volume however i did not write about these experiences but rather express them only in line with the texts of kant and marx acknowledgements in writing this book i was supposed ooh, I was supported by many people. I would ooh, especially like to thank translators Sabu Koso and Judy Gieb. Uh, I also would like to thank Jeff Waite, who checked the English translation and gave us invaluable suggestions. Frederick Jameson and Masa Masao Miyoshi have given me enduring moral support and constructive advice. I owe Akira Asada... Uh, Paul Anderer, Mitsuo Sekii, Indre Levy, and the late Yuji Naito, and Lynn Karatani for providing practical and patient encouragement for the realization of the book. I wonder if Lynn is his spouse. Kantian, so introduction, what is trans, crans? <laughs> what is crans critique? What is trans critique? Kantian philosophy is called transcendental, as distinct from transcendent. Simply stated, the transcendental approach seeks to cast light on the unconscious structure that precedes and shapes the shapes experience. And yet it can't be said yet sorry, and yet can't it be said that from its very inception, philosophy itself has always taken such an introspective approach? If that is the case, then what distinguishes Kantian reflection? Kant's unique way of reflection appears in his early work, Dreams of a Visionary. Kant wrote, quote, Formerly I viewed human common sense only from the standpoint of my own. Now I put myself into the position of another's reason outside of myself and observe my judgments and observe my judgments. Together with their most secret causes, from the view the, from the point of view of others it is true that the comparison of both observations results in pronounced parallax but it is the only means of preventing the optical delusion and of putting the concept of the power of knowledge in human nature in its true place what kant is saying here is not that not the platitude that one should see things not only from one's own point of view but also from the point of view of others in fact it is the reverse if one's subjective view is an optical delusion then the objective uh, ugh, cat hair in my mouth <laughs> sorry if one's subjective view is an optical delusion then the objective perspective or the viewpoint of others cannot be an optical delusion as well and if the history of philosophy is nothing but the history of such reflections then the history of philosophy is itself nothing but optical delusion the reflection that kant brought about is the kind that reveals that reflections in the past were optical delusions this kantian reflection as a critique of reflection is is engendered by pronounced parallax between the subjective viewpoint and the objective viewpoint. To explain, take an example of a technology that did not exist in Kant's time. Reflection is often spoken of by way of the metaphor of seeing one's image in the mirror. In the mirror, one sees one's own face from the perspective of the other. 
but in today's context, photography must also be taken into consideration. Compare the two. Although the mirror image can be identified with the perspective of the other, there is still certain complicity with regards to one's own viewpoint. After all, people can see their own image in the mirror as they like, while the photograph looks relentlessly, quote unquote, objective. Let's see. After all, people can see their own image in the mirror, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Of course, the photograph itself is an image, optical delusion, as well. What counts, then, is the pronounced parallax between the mirror image and the photographic image. At the time, photography was in... At the time that photography was invented, it is said that those who saw their own faces in pictures could not help but feel a kind of abhorrence. Just like hearing a tape recording of one's own voice for the first time. People gradually become accustomed to photographs. In other words, people eventually come to see their image in see the image in the photograph as themselves. The crux here is the pronounced parallax that people presumably experience when they first see their photographic image. Philosophy begins with introspection as mirror, and that is where it ends. No attempt to introduce the perspective of the other can change this essential fact. In the first place, philosophy began with Socrates' dialogue, but the dialogue itself is trapped within a mirror, so to speak. People alternately criticize Kant for having remained in a subjectivist self-scrutiny or search for a way out of that in the critique of judgment's introduction of plural subjects. But the truly revolutionary event in philosophy that had already occurred in Critique of Pure Reason, where Kant attempted to obliterate the complicity inherent in the introspection precisely by confining himself to the introspective framework. Here one can observe the attempt to introduce an objectivity qua otherness that is totally alien to the invention, sorry, to the conventional space of introspection equaling mirror. Kant has been criticized for his subjective method, lacking the other, but in fact his thought is always haunted by the perspective of the other. Critique of Pure Reason is not written in the self-critical manner of dreams of a visionary, and yet the pronounced parallax has not disappeared. This emerged in the form of antinomy, which exposes the fact that both thesis and antithesis are nothing more than optical delusions. In part one, I reread Kant from this perspective. The same is true of the young Hegelians. Oh, sorry. Uh, the same is true of part two. For instance, in the German ideology, Marx criticized the, the, the young Hegelians, a group which he himself had belonged just months before. When he was exiled to France, to Engels, or, ugh, sorry, let's read that again. The same is true of, the, for instance, in the German ideology, Marx criticized the young Hegelians, a group to which he himself had belonged just months before, when he was exiled to France. To Engels, this book presented a new view of history that replaced German idealism with an economic purview. German ideology was nothing more than the discourse of a backward nation attempting to realize conceptually that that which had that which had already become a reality in the advanced nation of England. But for Marx, it was by stepping outside of German Germany's ideology for the first time that he was able to experience an awakening accompanied by a certain shock. This was to see things neither from his own viewpoint nor, nor from the viewpoint of others, but to face the reality that it, it, that is exposed through difference or parallax. When he moved to England, Marx devoted himself to the critique of classical economics, which was then dominant. In Germany, Marx had already carried out the critique of capitalism and classical economic. Wait, okay. In Germany, Marx had already carried out the critique of capitalism and ca classical economics. What was it that endowed Marx with the, the new critical perspective that came to fruition in capital? It was an occurrence that, according to the discourse of classical economics, could only be an accident or a mistake. 
the economic crisis, or more precisely, the pronounced parallax brought about by it. What is important is the fact that Marx's critique has, was always born from migration and the pronounced parallax that results from it. Hegel uh, criticized Kant's subject, subjectivism and emphasized objectivity. But, uh, but in Hegel, the pronounced parallax discovered by Kant is extinguished. Likewise, the pronounced parallax discovered by Marx was extinguished by Engels and other Marxists. As a result, one is left with an image of Kant and Marx as thinkers who considered who constructed a solid, immovable system. A closer reading, however, reveals that they were in fact practicing a constant transposition, and that the move to uh, and that the move to different discursive systems was what brought about the pronounced parallax. This is obvious in the case of the exiled Marx, but the same thing can be observed in Kant as well. Kant was not an exile in spatial terms. He never moved away from his home, hometown of Konigsberg. Rather, it was, his, it was his stance that made him a kind of exile, a man independent from the state. Kant rejected a promotion to a post in Berlin, the center of state academia, instead insisting on cosmopolitanism. Kant is generally understood to have executed a transcendental critique from a place that lies between rationalism and empiricism. However, upon reading his strangely self-deprecating Dreams of a Visionary Explained by Dreams of Metaphysics, one finds it impossible to say that he was simply thinking from a place between these two poles. Instead, it is the parallax between positions that, act, that acts. Kant, too, performed a critical oscillation. What? He continuously confronted the dominant rationalism with empiricism, and the dominant empiricism with rationalism. The Kantian critique exists within the movement itself. The transcendental critique is not some kind of stable third position. It cannot exist without a transversal and transposition, transpositional movement. It is for this reason that I have chosen to name the dynamic critiques of Kant and Marx, which are both transcendental and transversal, cr transcritique. According to Louis Althusser, Marx made an epistemological break in the German ideology. But in my transcritical understanding, the break did not occur once, but many times. And this, is one, and this one in particular was not the most significant. It is generally thought that Marx's break in the German ideology was the establishment of historical materialism, but in fact that was pioneered by Engels, who wrote the main body of the book. One must therefore look at Marx as a latter comer to the idea. He came to it because of his obsession with a seem seemingly outmoded problem to Engels, the critique of religion. Thus Marx says, quote, For Germany, the criticism of religion is in the main complete. And criticism of religion is the premises of all criticism. So let's look at that. Oh my fucking beat up ass hand. My, my, my. All right. Uh, Marx, a con uh, Marx, a contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of law introduction. Ah, so the same thing from... Okay. Cool. Mm. Ugh. Sorry, I kind of have to hold the pages open. Um... He conducted a critique of state and capital as an extension of the critique of religion. In other words, he persistently continued the critique of religion under the names of state and capital. And this was not merely an application of the Feuerbachian theory of self-alienation that he later abandoned. The development of industrial capitalism made it possible to see previous history from the vantage point of production.
so so it is that Adam Smith could already pose a stance akin to historical materialism by the mid 18th century but historical historical <laughs> historical materialism what D oh sorry but historical materialism does not have the capitalist does not have the potency to elucidate the capitalist economy that created it capitalism i believe is nothing like the economic infrastructure it is a certain force that regulates humanity beyond its intentionality, a force that divides and recombines human beings. It is a relig religio-generic -gener entity. This is what Marx ought to decode. Sought. To <sighs> this is what Marx sought to decode for the whole of his life. Quote, a commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing. But its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. I think that that's from Capital, Volume 1. That's like towards the beginning, I'm pretty sure. That's a quote I recognize. It might be from the first chapter. Volume 1, yeah. Page. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. Eh. Page 102 to 103. Here, Marx is no longer questioning and problematizing metaphysics or theology in the narrow sense. Instead, he grasps the naughty problematic <laughs> the naughty problematic as an extremely obvious, trivial thing. Thinking this way about Marx, one realizes that an equivalent of historical materialism, or even what is known as Marxism for that matter, could have existed without Marx, while the text of Capital could not have existed if not for him. Interesting. The Marxian turn, the kind that is truly significant and that one cannot overlook, occurred in his middle career. In the shift from Grundrisse, or a contribution to the critique of political economy, to Capital. It was the introduction of the theory of value form. What provoked Marx's radical turn, which came after he finished writing the Grundrisse, was his initiation to skepticism. It was Bailey's critique of Ricardo's labor theory of value. According to David Ricardo, exchange value is inherent in a commodity, which is expressed by money. In other words, money is just an illusion, shine in Kant, uh, based upon the recognition both based upon this recognition, both Ricardian leftists and Proudhon insisted on abolishing currency and on replacing it with the labor money or the exchange bank criticizing them as he did however marx was still relying on the labor theory of value akin to ricardo on the other hand bailey criticized the ricardian position by claiming that the value of a commodity existed only its only in its relationship with other commodities and therefore the labor value of that ricardo it, insists is inherent in a commodity is an illusion let's Let's jump back at that again one more time. Sorry. On the other hand, Bill Bailey... Bill Bailey? <laughs> no. On the other hand, Bailey criticized the Ricardian position by claiming that the value of a commodity exists only in its relationship with other commodities, and therefore the labor value that Ricardo insists is inherent in a commodity as an illusion. Samuel Bailey's skepticism is similar to Hume's criticism that there is nothing like a Cartesian ego co cogito. There are just many egos. To this position, Kant responded that yes, an ego is an illusion, but functioning there is the transcendental ap apperception X. But what one, but what one knows as metaphysics is that. Is, but what one knows as metaphysics is that which considers the X as get down there as something substantial. Nevertheless, one cannot really escape from the drive treb to take it as an empirical substance in various contexts. 
If so, it is possible to say that an ego is not just an illusion, but a transcendental illusion. Kant achieved this position later in his life, but first, his dogmatic slumber had to be interrupted by Hume's skepticism. And in this precise manner, Marx must have been severely stricken by Bailey's skepticism. But again, like Kant, Marx developed his thought into another dimension, which I would like to call the transcendental reflection on value. All right, so we're talking about value theory right now. Um, we're talking about, I mean, almost like, you know, the, the, oh, almost, you know, uh, a little bit of dialectical thinking here. Um, actually, like, I guess, yeah, he's saying transcend transcendental because it also transcends that kind of dialectic, right? But it's not, it's, maybe it's not, I don't know. Maybe it's just thesis, antithesis, synthesis in that, you know, that a whole, that old thing, that old chestnut. But I don't know. We must continue. Oh, sorry, this is hurting my back a little bit. Ugh. Um, do Classical economics held that each commodity internalizes a labor value. But in reality, commodities can, can have values only after their relationship is synthesized by money. And each one of them is given its value. In reality, only prices exist as indicators of the mutual relations between commodities. Thus, Bailey stressed that the value of a commodity exists only thanks to its relationship with other commodities. But Bailey did not question what, ex what expresses price, money. In other words, he did not question what relates commodities to each other and composes the system. That is, money as the general equivalent. Money, in this sense, is totally irrelevant to money as substance like gold or silver. Rather, it is like a Kantian transcendental apperception X, as it were. What is an apperception? I'm going to have to look that up. Let's look that up, because I don't know what the fuck it means. Apperception. Let's see. Uh, conscious perception with full awareness, the process of understanding by which newly observed qualities of an object are related to past experience, the act of the mind by which it becomes conscious of its ideas as its own, perception which see with the added consciousness that is I who perceive. Huh, interesting. I'm gonna have to copy all that stuff. I'm gonna have to copy that. Let's see. Classical economics held that each commodity internalizes labor value, but in reality, commodities can have values only after blah, blah, blah. Well, it's over rather, it is like a Kantian. Okay. Money in this sense is totally irrelevant to money as substance like gold or silver. Rather, it is like a Kantian transcendental apperception X, as it were. The stance to see it in in relation to its materiality is what Marx called fetishism. After all, money as substance is an illusion, but more correctly, it is a transcendental illusion in the sense that it is hardly possible to discard it. For mercantilists and bullionists, the predecessors of classical economics, money was an an object to be revered. This was evidently the fetishism of money. Scorning this classical, scorning this classical economists posited the substance of value in labor in and of itself. But this so-called labor theory of value did not resolve the enigma of money. Rather, it reinforced 
and sustained it. Both Ricardo, the advocate of the labor theory of value, and Bailey, its radical critic, and the unacknowledged primogenitor of neoclassical economics, managed to erase money only superficially. As Marx said, in times of crisis, people still want money suddenly. <laughs> Going back to bullionism. The Marx of Capital stands on the side of the mercantilist rather than Ricardo or Bailey. By criticizing both Ricardo and Bailey on such a premise, his critique elucidated a form that constitutes the commodity economy. In other words, what Marx focused on was not the objects themselves, but the relational system in which the objects are placed. According to Marx, if gold becomes money, that that is not because of its imminent material characteristics, but because it is placed in the value form. The value form, consisting of relative value form and equivalent value form, makes an object that is placed in it that is placed in it money. Anything, anything that is exclusively placed in the general equivalent form becomes money. That is, it achieves the right to attain anything in exchange, i.e. its owner can attain anything in exchange. People consider a certain thing, i.e. gold, as sublime only because it fills the spot of general equivalent. Crucially, Marx begins his reflections on capital with the miser, the one who hoards the right to exchange. In the strict sense, the right to stand in the position of equivalent form at the expense of use. Come again. Uh, let's 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 read that one more time. Uh, do, 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 do. Crucially, Marx begins his reflections on capital with the miser, the one who hoards the right to exchange. In the strict sense, the right to stand in the position of equivalent form, at the expense of use. So, who hoards the right to chain to exchange? Okay. Um, the desire for money or the right to exchange is different from the desire for commodities themselves. I would call this drive, treep, in the Freudian sense, to distinguish it from desire. To put it another way, the drive of a miser is not to own an object, but to stand in the position of equivalent form, even at the expense of the object. The drive is metaphysical in nature. The miser's goal is to accumulate riches in heaven, as it were. It tends to scorn the drive of the mi it tends to scorn the drive of the miser, but capital's drive to accumulate is essentially the same. Capitalists are nothing but rational misers, to use Marx's term. Buying a commodity from someone somewhere and selling it to another uh, to anyone anywhere. Capitalists seek to to reproduce and expand their position to exchange. And the purpose is not to attain many uses. That is to say that the motive, the motive drive of capitalism is not in people's desire. Rather, it is the reverse. For the purpose of attaining the right to exchange, capital has to create people's desire. Okay. This drive of hoarding, the right to exchange, originates in the precariousness inherent in the in exchange among others. Historical materialists aim to describe what the relationships between nature and humans, as well as among humans themselves, transform, develop through history. What is lacking in this endeavor is any reflection upon the capitalist economy that er organizes the transformation slash development. And to this end, one must take consideration, take into consideration the dimension of exchange and why the exchange inexorably takes the form of value. Physiocrats and classical... Physiocrats and classical economists had the conviction that they could see 
all aspects of social relations transparently from the vantage point of, of production. The social exchange, however, is consistently opaque and thus appears as an autonomous force which we can hardly abolish. Engels' conviction that we should control the anarchic drive of capitalist production and transform it into a planned economy was little more than an extension of classical economist thought. And Engels' stance was, of course, the source of centralist communism. One of the most crucial transpositions slash breaks in Marx's theory of value form lies in its attention to use value in his lies in its attention to use value or the process of circulation. Say a certain thing becomes valuable only when it has use value to other people. A certain thing, no matter how much labor time is required to make it, has no value if not sold. Marx technically abolished the conventional division between exchange value and use value. No commodity contains exchange value as such. If it fails to relate to others, it will be a victim of sickness unto death, in the sense of Kierkegaard. Classical economists believe that a commodity is a th synthesis between use value and exchange value, but this is only an ex post facto recognition. Lurking behind this synthesis as event is a fatal leap, salto mortale. Kierkegaard saw the human being as a synthesis between finity and infinity, reminding us that what is at stake in this synthesis is inevitably faith. In commodity exchange, the equivalent religious moment appears as credit. Credit, the treaty of presuming that a commodity can be sold in advance, is an institutionalization of postponing the critical moment of selling a commodity. And the commodity economy constructed as it is upon credit inevitably nurtures crisis. Classical economics saw all economic phenomena from the vantage point of production and insisted that it had managed to demystify everything other than production by reasoning that it was secondary, was all secondary and illusory. As a result, it is mastered by the, it is mastered by the circulation and credit that it believes itself to have demystified and thus it can never elucidate why crisis occurs. Crisis is the appearance of the critical moment inherent in the commodity economy, and as such, it functions as the most radical critique of the, pol of the political economy. In this light, it may be said that that in this light, it may be said that pronounced parallax brought by crisis led Marx to capital. In the preface to the second edition of of Capital, Marx openly avowed himself to be the pupil of the mighty thinker Hegel. In fact, Marx sought to describe the capitalist economy as if it were a self-realization of capital qua the Hegelian spirit. Notwithstanding the Hegelian descriptive style, however, capital distinguish itse distinguishes itself from Hegel's philosophy in its motivation. The end of capital is never the absolute spirit. Capital reveals the fact that capital... Okay. Das Kapital reveals the fact that capital... Through organizing, the, through organizing the world can never go beyond its own limit. It is a Kantian critique of the, of the ill-contained drive of capital slash reason to self-realize beyond its limit. And all the enigmas of capital's drive are inscribed in the theory of value form. The theory of value form is not a historical reflection that follows exchange from barter to the formation of money. Value placed value placed within the monetary economy wait sorry value form is a kind of form that people are not aware of when they are placed within the monetary economy this is the form that is discovered by only transcendentally in the reverse of his descriptive order from form of value money form ugh. In the reverse of his descriptive order, from form of value, money form to miser, what the fuck, to merchant capital, to industrial capital, one has to read Marx's retrospective query from the latter to the former. 
What? That's so many bouncing around. In the reverse of his descriptive order, from form of value, money form to miser, to merchant, to capital, to industrial capital, one has to read Marx's retrospective query from the latter of the f- to the former. So from industrial capital back to the miser, I guess. Classical economists rebuked the businesses of bullionists, mercantilists, and merchant capitalists of the previous age and denounced their economic role. They argued that while they earn profit from the difference of unequal exchange, industrial capital makes money from fair, equal exchange. It derives profit from the division of labor and cooperative work. In contrast, Marx thought of capital by returning to the model of merchant capital. He saw capital in the general formula, money, commodity, money. This is to to see capital essentially as a merchant as merchant capital. Capital under this light is a self-increasing, self-reproductive money. This is the movement M C M to C to M prime itself. The case of uh, the case of industrial capital, which is usually considered to be totally different, differs only in that it in the oh, sorry differs only in that the role of C is a com- complex is a complex Jesus. Sorry, let's try that again. <laughs> the case of industrial capital, which is usually considered to be totally different, differs only in that the role of C is a com is a complex that consists of raw material, means of production, and labor power commodity. In this last labor power commodity. And this last labor power commodity is truly inherent in the in industrial capital. For industrial capital earns surplus value not by making workers work, but also by making them buy back in totality what they produce. Okay. Uh, okay, I guess that makes sense. For industrial capital earns surplus value not only by making workers work but also okay and making them put go back making them put their money that they work to make back into the economy okay to circulate money basically um looks like our playlist maybe ended ooh Ooh, it's windy outside. I can hear it. Alright. Um Shoo Bidoo Ah Shoo Bidoo Also like feel free to like, you know, type you know ask questions or ask me to read something again or see if i can fucking uh (laughs) fucking describe what the hell he's talking about um because honestly some of this stuff is going a little bit over my head i'm like kind of letting it wash over me Classical economists claim that merchant capital or mercantilism conducts unequal exchange misses the point. The fact is that when merchant capitalism attains surplus value from the exchange between uh, between the different value systems, each trade, either M to C or C to M, is strictly based upon equal exchange merchant capital attains surplus value from the space from spatial difference meanwhile industrial capital attains surplus value by incessantly producing new value systems temporally temporally that is with Sorry, let's try that again. Meanwhile, industrial capital attains surplus value by increasing 
by incessantly producing new value systems temporally, that is, with technological innovation. Ooh. Uh. This categorical division does not prevent industrial capital from attaining surplus value from the activity of merchant capital. Whatever the kind, capital is not choosy in how it attains surplus value. It always attains surplus value from the difference of value systems by equal exchange within each deal. But one of the points I want to pose is that how surplus value is earned, in contrast to how profit is earned, is strictly invisible, and the whole mechanism remains in a black box, as it were. Thus, invisibility is also a condition for the struggle within the process of circulation. Just use my phone as a little thing to hold down the page. It is troubling that many Marxists posit surplus value only in the exploitation of production process rather than the differences between value system. These Marxists see the relationship between capitalists and wage workers as a disguised extension of that between capital wait as that is that disguised ugh, sorry these Marxists see the relationship between capitalists and wage workers as a disguised extension of that between feudal lord and serf and they believe that this was marx's idea but it originated in the ricardian socialists who drew from ricardo's theory of profit the idea that profit making is equal to the exploitation of surplus value this became the central theory of the english labor movement in the early 19th century Though it is true that Marx himself said a similar thing time and again, and it may though it is true that Marx himself said a similar thing time and again, and it is true that Marx himself had a <laughs> Though it is true that Marx himself said a similar thing time and again, and it may entertain a vulgar ear, it should be distinguished from that aspect of Marx that actually elucidated the enigma of surplus value. The best it can do is to explain absolute surplus value achieved by the elongation of the labor day, but not relative surplus value achieved by the improvement of labor productivity. The particular characteristic of the particular characteristic of industrial capitalism. What is more, seeing the relationship between capitalist and wage worker in comparison with the relationship uh, with the relationship between feudal lord and serf is seriously misleading. Uh, first, it results in envisioning the uh, abolishment of the capitalist economy from the vantage point of the master-slave dialectic. And second, it leads to centralizing the struggle in production process by ignoring the circulation process. Huh, interesting. It leads to centralizing the struggle in production process by ignoring this. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I guess I never thought of it that way. We, we focus, we focus much more on production than we do on, at, like as Marxists, at least. Unless you're like a very, unless you're you know reading and writing stuff like this, I guess. Um, but for the most part, when when most of the Marxists I know, myself included, talk about this stuff, it's from the vantage point of oh that was very hot mm. from the vantage point of um the struggles in production and not necessarily in circulation uh, <clears throat> but those are just the people i know could be different it's different for other people i guess um, the Marx of Capital, in contrast, stresses the priority of the circulation process. In the manner of Kant, Marx points out an anton an antonym. An, uh, Marx points out an antinomy. He says 
On the other hand, that surplus value for industrial capital cannot be attained in the process of production in itself. And on the other hand, that it cannot be attained in the process of circulation in itself. He says that on the one hand, that surplus value for industrial capital cannot be attained in the process of production in itself. And on the other hand, that it cannot be attained in the process of circulation in itself. Hence, hic rotis, hic salta. Nevertheless, this antinomy can be undone. That is only by proposing that the surplus value for industrial capital comes from the difference between the difference of value systems in the circulation process, like in merchant capital. And yet, that the difference is created by technological in innovation in the production process. Okay, different value systems in the circulation process, and then the difference created by technological innovation in the production process. Capital has to discover and create difference incessantly. This is the driving force for the endless technological innovation in, di in industrial capitalism. It is not that the productionism comes from people's hope for the progress of civilization as such. As such. It is widely believed that the, the development of the capitalist economy is caused by our material desires and faith in progress. So it is, so it is that it would always seem possible to change our mentality and begin to control reckless development rationally. And further, it would seem possible to abolish capitalism itself when we wish. The drive of capitalism, however, is deeply inscribed in our society and culture. Or, more to the point, our society and culture are created by it. It will never stop by itself, neither will it be stopped by any rational control or by state intervention. Marx's capital does not reveal the necessity of revolution. As the Japanese Marxian political economist Kozo Uno, 1897 to 1977, pointed out, it only presents the necessity of crisis. Okay, uh, what is that footnote? Five, six, four. Jesus, my eyes are garbaccio. See, Cosa Uno, Principles of Political Economy and Crisis, even though it is the peculiar illness of the capitalist economy, is the catalyst for the incessant, for in, its incessant development. Crisis, even though it is the peculiar illness of capitalist economy, is the, oh, is the catalyst for its incessant development. It is part of the whole mechanism. The capitalist economy cannot eradicate the plague, yet neither will it perish because of it. Environmentalists warn that the capitalist economy will cause unprecedented disasters in the future. Yet it is also... Yet it is... Not that these disasters will terminate the capitalist economy. Also, it is impossible that capitalism will coll collapse by the reverse dynamic when, in the future, commodification is pushed to its limit. It is impossible that it would die a natural death. It is impossible that capitalism will collapse by the reverse dynamic when, in the future, commodification is push pushed to its limit. It is impossible that it would die a natural death. Interesting. I'll have to think on that. Finally, the only solution most of us can imagine today is state regulation of capital's reckless movement. But we should take notice of the fact that the state, like capital, is driven by its own certain autonomous power, which won't be dissolved by the globalization of... Lick your finger, turn the page. Lick your finger, turn the page. Like you think it turned the page. Capitalism. Or the globalization of capitalism. Yeah. As we have seen pretty much already. Um, this autonomy should nevertheless be understood in distinction from the sense of historical materialism's doctrine. Uh, that doctrine that state and nation assume superstructure in relationship with economic base. 
they are relatively autonomous to, though determined by it. First of all, as I have suggested, the very notion that the capitalist economy is base or infrastructure uh, is itself questionable. As I have tried to elucidate in the book, the world organized by money and credit is rather one of illusion, with a peculiarly religious nature. Saying this from the opposite view, even though state and nation are composed by communal illusion, precisely like capitalism, they inevitably exist thanks to their ne necessary grounds. Simply put, they are founded on exchanges that are different from the commodity exchange. So it is that no matter how many times one stresses their nature of being imagined communities, it is impossible to dissolve them as though Marx pointed out, as young Marx pointed out vis-a-vis -vis another bind. To abolish religion as the illusory happiness of the people is to demand the real happiness. The demand to give up illusions about the existing state of affairs is the demand to give up a state of affairs which needs illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore in embryo the criticism of the veil of tears, the halo of which is religion. The same can be said of state and nation. Um, interesting. That's, I mean, it's along the same sentiment of, I think, along the same lines of what he meant when he called uh, religion the opiate of the masses. Right? A lot of people get that. Oh, what is that? Sorry. So those five and six. Um, five Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities, and Marx Capital Volume 1. Next one is also from Marx Capital Volume 1. Yeah, he says uh, the opium of the masses in the, I think it's in the manifesto if I remember correctly. Um, and what he's he says is that religion is, you know, I, I mean, it's what, what Karatani just quoted and wrote there after reflecting upon value form the marks of capital seems to explicate the historical genesis of commodity exchange in the chapter process of exchange there he stresses that it began in between communities the exchange of commodities begins where communities have their boundaries at their at their points of contact with other communities or with members of the latter However, as soon as products have become commodities in the external relations of a com community, they also, by reaction, become commodities in the internal life of the community. This is also from Capital Volume 1. Despite its appearance, this depiction is not strictly of a historical situation, but the form of exchange that is discovered and stipulated only by a transcendental retrospection. Furthermore, Marx's statement, which I quoted earlier, is in fact based upon the premise that there are form other forms of value exchange, or other forms of exchange. Commodity exchange is a peculiar form of exchange among other exchanges. Uh, say that five times fast, Jesus. Uh, first, there is exchange within a community, a reciprocity of gift and return. Though based upon mutual aid, it is... Wait, sorry. It also... Oh, come on. There we go. It also imposes the community's code. Um, mm -mm -mm. If one does not return, one will be ostracized and... And ex... Oh, is community's code and exclusivity. If one does not return, one will be ostracized. Second, the original exchange between between communities is plunder and rather it is the plunder that is the basis of the basis for other exchanges for instance commodity exchange begins only at the point where mutual plunder is given up uh, boo, 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 boo. Uh, in this sense plunder is deemed a type of exchange for instance, in order to plunder continuously, it is necessary to protect the plundered from other plunderers. <laughs> Plunder, okay. And even nurture economico-industrial growth. This is the prototype of the state. 
In order to keep on robbing and robbing more and more, the state guarantees the protection of land and the reproduction of labor power by redistribution. It also promotes agricultural production by public undertakings such as regulating water distribution through public waterworks. It follows that the state does not appear to be abetting to be abetting a system of robbery. Farmers think of think of paying tax as a return duty for the production protection of the lord. Farmers think of paying tax as a return duty a return or duty for the protection of the lord. Merchants pay tax as a return for the protection of their exchange and commerce. Finally, the state is represented as a superclass entity of reason. 